This occurred in August of 2019. I am what would be classified as an outdoors person. I like to camp in dispersed areas of public land. I hike and explore in areas that are extremely rugged, and often a local guide is recommended for people hiking Utah's high mountain peaks and deserts. I am trained and experienced with using bushcraft skills. I do everything I can related to the outdoors. Sometimes I am with family or friends, but usually I prefer to be alone in my explorations. It is not recommended even for people experienced with the outdoors. One of the things I do and try to do daily as my form of exercise is metal detecting. When I am out on explorations, this often includes finding long ago abandoned mines, ghost towns, and other signs of pioneer settlements. During one of my explorations, I decided to attempt finding a particular ghost town I had seen on an old map. I packed my gear and equipment and hit the road. On reaching the site, I read the signboard. Site conditions, barren, very difficult to access. Some structures remaining, but in very poor and unsafe conditions. Last known inhabitants, mid 1930s, left because the local mine closed during the Great Depression. Most recent signs of activity from vandals, partiers, and hunting groups. Access. Modern-day transportation has difficulty with access, even with 4x4 and off-road equipment. The roads to access this area are extremely rugged, with desert rock terrains ascending and descending across sharp cliff sides and deep canyon walls. The nearest current rural resident is almost 17 miles away. Accessing this area on foot is near impossible. The details on this sign will come into play during the rest of the story. I arrived and set up my shelter, a two-man tent that requires staking into the ground and has a full cover rain shell. Entering the tent means zipping open the rain shell and then zipping open the tent door. I found an area in a stand of juniper trees and pushed the stakes into the soft soil under the base of the trunks and roots. I was happy. It was early evening, my shelter was already up. I had my cooking fire roaring away and preparing itself for the juicy steak I was eating for dinner. While my fire was heating up, I performed a basic security check of my location. I walked around in V-shaped lines through my camp area and then explored the immediate perimeter. I was completely alone, isolated in desolation with no signs of current human activity for as far as I could see and hear. It was paradise. I didn't see anything of particular concern during my patrol. I headed back to camp, had dinner, a drink of bourbon, and went to bed around 9.30. Before bedding down for the night, I performed one last sweep of my camp and ensured everything was locked down. I climbed into my tent, prepped my sleeping spot, put my gun in its normal spot next to me, and turned out my light. I awoke the next morning when the sun became too intense to bear. It was only just after seven o'clock and already hot as hell outside. My feet were facing east, so the morning sun was glaring directly into my face. I tried to pull my pillow and extra blanket over my eyes and create a shade tent. It worked. I started drifting back to sleep. Then my bladder decided it was also awake and desperately needed to be emptied. I fought the urge to get up and rolled back over. As I started shutting my eyes, I heard something that immediately sent shivers down my spine. At this point, I will let you in on a little bit of background about myself, without going into any specific details. I have spent much of my working life in security and investigation positions. I have been involved in hostile situations requiring use of force and been assigned to high-risk cases. During the course of my employment, I've learned how to track and locate humans. With this adapted skill set comes certain abilities, like being able to identify details about someone based on listening to their footsteps. And that is exactly what caught my attention that morning, laying in my tent with an overfilled bladder trying to burst out the front of my abdomen. Footsteps, human footsteps, very close to where I was laying. I lay completely still. In the desert, it is so quiet that you can hear pebbles bouncing off the face of boulders from across a canyon. Any movement I made would alert this person. 
I didn't know their intentions and definitely didn't want them to come any closer to my tent. I froze, motionless. From the sound of the footsteps, it was a male. Unknown age or appearance, unknown height, weight, approximately 180, 200 pounds. His footsteps were alarming. The way he was placing his feet was in an unnatural and intentional pattern. He wasn't just strolling through, he was moving methodically, as if trying to tiptoe through the desert. The same way a predator moves while circling its prey, and trying to camouflage their motions so as to not disturb the surrounding environment. I continued listening. He tiptoed away from me towards my car. I listened as he tried pulling on the car doors. I heard him walking around the car, probably looking in the windows. He had moved to the other side of my car, where the footsteps were much further away. I took advantage of this moment and very quietly but steadily pulled the zipper down on my sleeping bag. I took a second to stretch my limbs to relieve the tense cramping and quietly rolled to my side. I grabbed the holster of my gun, rolled back into a more comfortable position, and sat completely still again. I listened carefully to what the intruder was doing. He was still making his predatory walk, moving in all directions. South of the camp, approximately 50 feet. Back to camp. East of the camp, approximately 50 feet. Back to camp. As if he was checking to see if anyone else was around, maybe checking to ensure there were no witness to interfere with whatever his plan was. Suddenly he changed directions. He was walking in my direction. Not walking. Slow charging. The same intimidating walk that police officers do when approaching a suspect. Commanding, purposeful, marching directly towards my tent. His intense walking pattern was also making quite a bit of racket so he was unable to hear anything I might have been doing. I slowly changed position so I was sitting up, making sure not to make any drastic movements that would ruffle the tent. I quietly pulled my firearm from the holster and switched the safety to off. I pulled my arms into my chest, raising the gun to the hold-ready position. I waited. He was still on his march, almost to the side of my tent. He stopped directly at the side, and then slowly crept around it, looking to see if I was awake. He then slowly walked around to the front of the tent and stood there. He walked back and forth a couple of times, looking in different directions. Then he came up to the tent door. I heard him undo the Velcro for the zipper on the rain fly. I held the grip of my pistol with my right hand and had my left laying flat and peacefully across the top of the slide. With a certain amount of demonstrated violence and intensity, he yanked the zipper up. He stopped and looked around again to see if anyone had noticed that sound. Apparently not. He reached in and grabbed the second zipper and started trying to pull on it. The zipper that was five inches from my knee, and the only thing separating myself from this person. The zipper was mildly jammed, so he was struggling for a second and trying to get the track to line up correctly. I took this second to let him know I was sitting there. I squeezed the slide in my left hand and racked my gun as hard and loudly as I possibly could, then immediately put my hands into the fire-ready position with the barrel pointing directly at him. He fell backwards onto his butt, taking three sliding hops back to escape while he was stumbling. He froze in place, and I could see his silhouette rise slowly from the ground with his hands up above his head. He stood in place for about 10 seconds and then slowly stepped backwards, inching away from me with every move. He continued to walk away, then stop to check if I was coming out. Then he'd move further away and repeat the process. Eventually he sounded as if he had moved out of earshot. Maybe two to three minutes had passed since I'd pointed my gun at him. I crawled forward and opened the zipper on my tent door. The door for my rain shell was flapping in the breeze. I quickly identified my next point of cover and didn't see any signs of anyone being around. I dodged from my tent and was able to safely maneuver to the tree stand near my vehicle. I waited in between two junipers and scanned the entire area before emerging from my concealment to complete a detailed patrol of camp. I didn't find anything out of place or suspicious after this. I don't know which direction the person went, 
where they came from and how they were able to access such a remote location while traveling on foot. To this day, it remains one of the most haunting experiences of my life. Kevin and I embarked on a backpacking adventure deep into the heart of Glacier National Park, a journey that promised both isolation and the untamed beauty of nature. The hike took us 17 miles into a secluded haven where we set up our camp beneath the sprawling canopy of ancient trees. As the sun dipped below the jagged peaks, casting long shadows over our makeshift sanctuary, we nestled into our sleeping bags, the crisp mountain air tinged with the promise of adventure. The distant rush of the wind through the pines serenaded us to sleep, and the ethereal glow of the moonlight bathed our camp in an otherworldly silver sheen. It was in the dead of night when I awoke to an unsettling scratching sound that sliced through the tranquility. Conscious of the presence of grizzly bears in the vicinity, Kevin and I exchanged glances, a silent acknowledgement that danger might be lurking in the shadows. Hoping to scare away any potential intruders, we erupted into a cacophony of noise, our shouts piercing the stillness of the night. Yet the scratching persisted, evolving into a peculiar digging noise that sent shivers down our spines. Paralyzed by fear, neither Kevin nor I dared to venture out of our tents. Suddenly the mountain air crackled with a voice, a scratchy, gravelly voice that echoed with an otherworldly cadence. You don't belong here. This is mine. You don't belong here. This is mine. You don't belong here. This is mine. The words reverberated through the wilderness, a haunting mantra that echoed the possessive claim of an unseen presence. The digging continued unabated for what felt like an eternity, each scrape of earth against earth magnifying the eerie ambience that enveloped us. Petrified with fear, we clung to the false safety of our tents, unable to comprehend the source of the unearthly voice that claimed ownership of the wilderness. Morning light brought with it a tentative courage to investigate the aftermath of the night's ordeal. Bracing ourselves, we unzipped our tents and were met with a disconcerting sight. Small cereal bowl-sized holes, meticulously spaced about six inches apart, encircled our tent like a mysterious border. The realization struck that our sanctuary had been violated in ways that transcended the natural order of the wild. Haunted by the night's events, we hastily tore down our camp, eager to distance ourselves from the spectral whispers that lingered in the mountain air. As we prepared to leave, four campers approached us. As they came closer, we recognized them. I had shared a Facebook post about our intended camping location. Grinning, they admitted to orchestrating the unsettling prank, transforming the serenity of the wilderness into a stage for their eerie theatrics. The revelation evoked nervous laughter, yet our eyes betrayed the lingering trauma that clung to our memories. We laugh about it now, but the scars of that night linger in our eyes, a testament to the thin veil that separates the tranquility of nature from the haunting unknown that lurks in its depths. The wilderness may reclaim its solitude, but the echoes of that unearthly voice reverberate in the recesses of our minds and have forever left an indelible mark on our journey through the untamed wilds of Glacier National Park. When I turned 18, a yearning for adventure fueled our road trip to the Apalachicola National Forest near Tallahassee. Our motley crew sought refuge from the trappings of society, a desire that led us deep into the heart of the dense woods. After setting up camp and indulging in a few drinks, the allure of the unknown beckoned my friend and me to explore the hidden secrets that lay beyond the trees. As we followed an unmarked trail, the forest closed in around us, shrouding our path in an eerie silence. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows that danced through the trees. The deeper we ventured, the more unsettling the atmosphere became, as if the very woods harbored secrets best left undisturbed. Suddenly we stumbled upon another trail, 
beckoning us further into the labyrinthine wilderness. An unspoken curiosity propelled us forward until the curtain of darkness enveloped us. The forest seemed to exhale, revealing signs of human habitation that sent shivers down our spines. Someone was living here, hidden away from the prying eyes of the world. Our eyes widened as we approached a clearing, revealing a makeshift campsite nestled in the heart of the forest. Clothes hung on lines, coolers were scattered around, and a lone dog lounged beside a weathered van that served as the dwelling of its mysterious occupant. The scent of smoke lingered in the air, an unsettling indication that we had inadvertently stumbled upon someone's secret refuge. Caught between the impulse to retreat and the allure of the unknown, we hesitated. The man, older and weathered, emerged from the shadows, his eyes locking onto ours. A cautious nod passed between us, and we attempted to back away silently, hoping to evade his notice. Yet fate had other plans. His gravelly voice echoed through the stillness, calling us over. An odd mixture of friendliness and wariness filled the air as he greeted us, offering tidbits of information about the park and suggesting places we should explore. Despite the strange encounter, we engaged in casual conversation for about ten minutes, the man's quirks dismissed as harmless eccentricities. Returning to our campsite, we chuckled nervously, attributing the encounter to the odd characters one might encounter in the vastness of nature. But the universe has a twisted sense of timing. Fast forward two months, a chilling phone call from my friend urged me to turn on the television. There on the screen was the man from the woods, the very same man we met that night, now on trial for four gruesome murders. A cold shiver traced the contours of my spine, and an unsettling knot tightened in the pit of my stomach. The reality of the encounter, once dismissed as an oddity of the wilderness, now unfolded in a more sinister light. The man whose eyes had locked onto mine in the heart of the Apalachicola National Forest was revealed as a murderer. A surreal sense of dread washed over me as the weight of the realization settled in. The charming eccentricities, the friendly conversation, all concealing the darkness that lurked within. In the quiet aftermath of that revelation, a profound unease clung to my thoughts. The encounter was no longer a mere anecdote of an odd encounter in the woods. It became a haunting brush with true evil, an acknowledgement of how close we had come to becoming unwitting witnesses to the unfolding tragedy. As the trial unfolded on the television screen, I couldn't help but reflect on the fragility of our existence. The woods, where we sought solace and escape, had become a backdrop for a real-life nightmare. The realization that I had been in the presence of a murderer sent shivers down my spine, casting a long, disconcerting shadow over the memories of that fateful night. In the silent aftermath, the once charming eccentricities of the man took on a macabre hue. Every casual word, every friendly gesture, became tainted by the knowledge that I had brushed shoulders with someone capable of unspeakable horrors. The woods, once a sanctuary, now carried the weight of an unsettling truth. The veneer of nature could conceal the darkest secrets. Haunted by the revelation, I grappled with the unnerving thought that our chance encounter could have taken a far more sinister turn. The chilling encounter had become an indelible chapter in the story of that night, a stark reminder that evil could wear the mask of the ordinary, even in the heart of the wilderness.